this screen. Got it. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, we can see. Great. So and what and ask questions along the way. That's fine. I have trouble figuring where the actual chat is, but just ask a question. You can just yell out or something. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> this is an old, this is from an old book, an old urology book from the 1800s. Um, and the quote was extra fear, ectopia of the bladder is probably the most intolerable of all human malformations as the constant expulsion of urine from the exposed ureteral orifices causes constant annoyance to both the patient and those near him. That's, uh, that's actually a 1918, but Hugh Cabot was a famous urologist um, who you know, worked back in those days. Um, this is the way extrophy creatively was managed. Um, they excised the bladder, the bladder plate. They gave uh, nephrostomy tubes with big incisions. And then these were fitted over rubber like appliances to bags. Um, and they, they, these didn't work well um, because they leaked constantly. So these people kind of really suffered. And just as I think we have kids all over the world that suffer from this problem, um, it, it made me think about a little bit, what do we do in in places where we don't maybe have all the necessary items and support to uh, provide the care for kids with the extra fee. It does take uh, OR time, uh, multiple, sometimes multiple uh, anesthetics. It takes expertise in anesthesia um, and it takes suture, fine instruments, and then healing time. Uh, uh, with, with, with nursing care. So it really uses many resources. Um, there's trips that I've been on where I've closed two extra fees or three extra fees in a week amongst the other things that we do and we just run out of suture. And um, that happened, that's happened at least once or twice um, in Ghana. For some reason, we see a lot of kids with extra fee and someone will show up at the end of the week with extra fee. And by then we've exhausted all the suture. But really is kind of a tale of two cities. Um, and on the left side is a boy that I saw in Senegal with a small fibrotic bladder plate with uh, hematomas. That's where the, these are these bulges on the surface. The emphalocele uh, has epithelialized over. Um, this boy though did have a reason or some bladder plate under here that we could actually bring out for, for use. And this is kind of maybe, this is a small bladder plate, but this is more of what we see as a newborn here in the States. The boy on the left presented at eight months of age, and this is a newborn with a very similar type of anatomy. If you can see this bladder plate doesn't have the same fibrotic changes. So when we have, when we have uh, extra fee, what are the things that I'm thinking about? And it really comes down to two things. Really first on the right side, first do no harm. Uh, and then how do you achieve any sort of functional closure? And what, is, what exactly is a functional closure? Do you employ techniques um, that we were taught from Hopkins? Do we employ techniques from the other side of the United States? Uh, from Mike Mitchell and Seattle and, um, and Rich Grady? Do we use other techniques from Germany? Do we use techniques um, such as the Kelly procedure, which um, has had some, I haven't done many Kelly, or I've incorporated some Kelly uh, procedure management um, uh, in the things that I do. Um, but the first thing you really want to do is preserve the upper tracts. You know, these kids have normal kidneys at birth. You don't want to create a situation of where they start ending up with either obstruction uh, and infection or the combination of the two to end up in renal failure. Um, continence is probably the greatest concern of when I, when I meet people. It's not just the, 
cosmetic aspect, but it's also the consonants. And, and it's very difficult to hide the wraparound smell that these kids have of urine as they get into grade school ages. Um, reproductive health is a concern. Sexual function is, of course, a concern. Um, cosmesis. And the problems that we see in managing these kids typically are lack of medical supplies. Catheters are, are important uh, not only during the initial closure, but more importantly afterward, um, if kids need to have uh, be started on intermittent catheterization, you have to be able to drain the bladder to prevent um, problems with the kidneys, infections in particular. Other things that I've seen in my time, especially in Africa, is cultural, cultural uh, inhibitions to having using catheters. Um, some of these kids don't even make it to the hospital. Um, there, I've, I've met a number of kids that are in their late teens, early twenties that parents kind of hid away in some, in some cultures. Um, there's a lack of surgical expertise um, in part because you need, you need to uh, see this, you need to be a student of how to manage kids like this. Um, you also need the instrumentation. You need magnification to do the proper surgery. Um, there is, and so not only medical supplies as far as catheters, but the surgical supplies, instrumentation, and very importantly, pediatric anesthesia. And I've had a number, I've had several kids that um, have, have um, one went into uh, VTAC under pediatric anesthesia at the beginning of the procedure and luckily survived. And another boy who underwent um, pulseless electronic activity uh, from too much uh, halothane. So um, having an accredited you know, uh, pediatric anesthesiologist is really, is really important. Um, orthopedics is another consideration and not that you always need them, but I utilize an orthopod for all the extra feet closures that I do. And then postoperatively, you do need an ICU in most cases. Um, most of our kids spend at least 24 hours in the ICU um, and sometimes intubated overnight after the initial closure. Um, and then there's of course, socioeconomic issues. Families that have to travel far distances can't do that. Um, they might be able to save money and bring their child in once to see you for the surgery, but um, they may never be able to get to come back. And then a big problem with, with any of our trips that we take to Africa or anywhere in the world is what is the follow-up like? What complications are we not seeing? Because we, we, the follow-up is very, very difficult. So the things that I rarely or never see in when I travel, let me see if I can go back here, is a successful local closure. I have, I have yet to see one. Typically these kids, um, their bladders pop out again and they're really no better and in, mo in more cases worse off than they were to begin with because now tissue has been taken away and there's more scar tissue at the bladder plate and especially around the urethra. Um, I see very few newborns. Um, and then follow-up is rare. And as many times as I've gone back to places like Zambia, uh, Senegal, Ghana, Ethiopia, um, I, uh, I've, I've not seen much follow-up and these kids really don't come back. What I commonly see are failed repairs. Um, I see a lot of fresh uh, extra fees of all different ages and usually some degree of desperation and acceptance if we can't help them, unfortunately. And then a lot of gratitude when we're able to maybe do something. So where do you start the training for these? For these, um, And surprisingly, you start at the beginning. So the beginning really starts in what you can see in the operating room. Um, that's the first thing. That may not be so, may, may not be so possible where you are if people aren't doing extra fee closures, but when groups come to close extra fees, or if you know of places where they do extra fee closure, 
I know this sounds probably highly unlikely, but India is a place where they have clinics that do extra fee closures. And several times a year, colleagues go there to close extra fees. Coming to the States is also a possibility. We have a, a coalition of surgeons that travel uh, to different hospitals in the United States to do extra fee closures. And these people have pretty significant um, background in, in doing these kinds of surgeries. The other thing then is really you, what you can find on YouTube and the internet. There are many, many videos now of, of people demonstrating their techniques and, and how they might do one repair or the other for extra fee. That didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and so there, there are places to start your training. Reading is obviously a good thing to do too. Um, I, I think there's a progression that people should feel comfortable with when it comes to extra fee closure. Um, the first idea is to get the bladder closed. Um, and one question is, well, when should you do that? And up until maybe the last five years, we did this all within the first 48 hours of life. Um, and that is, of course, a problem when, um, when, when there's a surgical workshop anywhere else. Um, but we found that that's probably not the best, the best thing to do, even, even here in most cases. And we've, we've kind of stopped that. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so teaching when not to operate is important. If you, I think when you have a problem that you don't have a good surgical option for, you don't have the instrumentation, you don't have the sutures, obviously you shouldn't. Um, and what not to operate on. I think most of the kids that I've seen um, have already been processed several times, sometimes having had two or three bladder closures, um, all of which have failed. And they're left with really a very limited amount of uh, things that they can do. So you really wanna think I like to think backward, I say, and I tell my residents and fellow that, that if you think about what outcome and in particular, what complications you're trying to avoid, then it will definitely influence what kind of surgery you do. Um, if you think the last thing I want to do is convert this kid into a healthy kid who can go out and play soccer, is eating well, is growing, um, and is seven years old, and I'm going to turn them into someone who gets chronic infections and maybe renal failure, well, that's not what you want to do. You're, you're going to have to be patient and hopefully find a, a better alternative for that patient. There's a pediatric urologist uh, in Tennessee who I like very much, who said this at one of our meetings. And his point was, how can I achieve lasting value for this child with the least number of operations? And, and I, I think that's also a good way to think about bladder extrophy. Um, so, and, and that really leads to what are the goals of the surgery to begin with. So that's something that, that takes uh, studying, just as you had to study for medical school and residency. It's studying what are really the goals of any of these operations that we do. So extra fee is kind of a spectrum of malformations, it includes the urinary, as you know, the urinary tract, genital tract, musculoskeletal system, intestinal tract. And it was first uh, reconstructed by a famous surgeon named Trendelenburg in 1906. That was the first, uh, the first effort. It's a herniation of the bladder through the anterior abdominal wall and the lower abdominal wall. Typically you see a widened pubic bone, abnormal abdominal muscles, and then shorter than average urethra, vagina, uh, or penis. The, um, Cloacal extrophy, I'm not going to talk much about because that really is a, a more involved operation uh, surgery. Survival is challenging, um, I think, in, in places that we travel to for these kids. It's a very rare condition, one in 200 to 400,000. I probably close, uh, on average, probably one kid a year with uh, cloacal extrophy. Um, some years I've had more than that. We, we, we're a center for uh, bowel transplant. So a lot of these kids have short gut. So they, they come in because of their short gut and then I take care of them for their cloacal extra fee. Um, so bladder extra fee is about three in 100,000. 
it's got a male predominance. There is an inheritance pattern about one in a hundred for a family and for an offspring one in 70. Um, so it's about 500 times greater if you have a, uh, if you have extra fee yourself. Um, this is a very common board question, but uh, that puts a lot of people to sleep, but it's basically, it's an abnormality of the urogenital septum as it comes down to the coital membrane. If it comes down and successfully makes it to the coital membrane and there's a rupture then uh, of the urogenital membrane, which is, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm having trouble seeing it myself actually. There it is. So if this were to rupture, you end up with the bladder, with bladder extrophy. If the cloacal membrane does not come all the way down, I'm sorry, if the rectal septum does not come all the way down to the cloacal membrane and this rupture is premature, you end up with the cloacal extrophy. Uh, it's the cloacal membrane uh, is a bilaminar layer. Um, I showed you a picture of that. There's a mesenchymal ingrowth between the layers of the cloacal membrane. They feel that people believe that embryologically, this is what is abnormal and why you end up with an, with an abnormal uh, anterior abdominal wall as well. So it's really a premature rupture that causes this. Um, it can be seen uh, prenatally. Uh, it's typically when you don't see a bladder fill prenatally. Um, and here is a fetus, a very young fetus with an extra feed bladder that you can see. Typically, um, you know, there's multiple ultrasounds that are done over a course of time that sh never show a bladder filling. And that's very, that's very suspicious then for a bladder extra feed. Um, the priorities of management, um, when I see these kids, obviously the, the first thing is uh, determining if this is a male or female, that's pretty easy. Um, I think under really no circumstances should you ever consider uh, gender, gen, um, gender reassignment under these circumstances. And I would say the same for colloquial extrophy as well. And their phalluses can be very, very abnormal in the male. Um, the quality and size of the bladder plate um, extent of the dia dia uh, diathesis of the pubic ramus. What that means is if it's more than four centimeters, then thought really needs to be given to doing osteotomies before you attempt closure um, or during the time of closure. And the reason being is, is that with that tension that's on the pubic bone, then there's a good chance the bladder will re-extrophy. It'll pop back out actually prolapse through itself without um, it being firmly established in the pelvis. And you really do need a good pelvic closure for that. Um, the idea of doing this closure before um, 48 hours or so when the pelvis is more flexible um, is the idea you don't need to do osteotomies. You can just bring the, the, the pelvis together. I find that even if you do osteotomies in, a, let's say, a two-month-old, um, then you, it's still challenging to get the pubic ramus together easily. Sometimes you luck out. Um, I would say that the timing now for doing osteotomies is, in my mind, is between two and three months of age. These kids are typically born at term. They're not premature. They have normal kidneys. They have normal lungs. They do not have cardiac defects. Uh, they're really they're really healthy kids otherwise. So should we wait? I think we should. I think kids are a lot uh, healthier from an anesthetic standpoint when they're two to three months of age or older or a little bit older. And I think you just take proper care. Um, the skeletal defect that you see is diastasis of the pubic ramus, um, external rotation of the posterior aspect of the pelvis and retroversion of the acetabulum um, and then there's a, there is a shortening of the pubic rami, so, so we can't assume that we'll, we'll really get the pubic rami together in the front, that is, even with osteotomies. Uh, we already, I already mentioned abdominal wall defects. They have a foreshortened lower abdomen. Uh, 
the emphalocele uh, terminates of where terminates low just above the bladder. That's where the umbilicus ends up. So you have to create a new umbilicus for these kids. A lot of them like to have a like to have a belly button. So that's important to them. Um, and then, uh, then importantly, uh, it should be recognized that in kids with bladder extrophy, the phallus is going to be short. So the posterior corporal length is normal in these kids. So on the left side, the brown part is the, um, just get my cursor here. It's having trouble tracking for some reason. There it is. The posterior element of the corporal bodies are, are normal. And this is, this is let's say, normal um, for a normal total corporal length. And even with bringing together the pubic rami, the corporal, anterior corporal bodies are still short. They're still abnormally short. And typically what happens after these are brought together, and you can use external fixation or spica cast, healing is such that over the course of years, this separates again. Um, and because of that, you end up with uh, the penis not getting any longer as during development. This is a boy I took care of a long time ago. I think I've already shown this picture. Um, this is what we would consider a functional penis. Um, part of what you need to do that is release the core D, um, which is by rotating the corporal bodies. Um, and that's, you mentioned epispadius repair. That's one of the hallmarks of an epispadius repair is rotation of the corporal bodies. If you do a, um, if you do a Ransley technique for an epispadius repair, um, mobilizing the crur from the mid, for the midline. And nowadays we separate the urethra actually from the corporal bodies for more adequate closure. And I'll show you pictures of that. Um, this is a picture that these kids do have a prostate. They do have ejaculatory ducts. So the, if you would imagine, this is about the level of where the true bladder neck is. Here's the prostatic urethra. These are ejaculatory ducts. So you can really see this urethra is, is somewhat short. Um, and people have employed different techniques to lengthen the urethra and they've failed. So we don't, we don't try to do those sorts of techniques anymore. For females, uh, they have a short vagina. It's normal caliber, but is shortened. So it's important for people to know when they're teenagers, if they are sexually active, that they have a much higher risk of pregnancy um, uh, without intercourse. Um, and, uh, and they also have a bifid clitoris typically. So they do need a feminizing genitoplasty, but internally fallopian tubes, ovaries are normal. Their pelvic floor is not, and it does predispose mature females to uterine prolapse. This is a variant in a female of, of a suprapubic fissure, which is quite rare. I've only seen one of these kids. And um, this is considered a, it's not an epispadius, but they are, epis, but these kids are epispadiac, but they do have a bladder extrophy with a fissure above. You can see there's a small, Phallocele, this is umbilical stump, it's low set. Um, and you really do treat these kids as bladder extrophy and reconstruction. Um, so some of the other anatomic abnormalities are um, the bladder mucosa may appear normal or can appear normal. There's something called hamartomas. Hamartomas are, uh, are, are um, fibrous, um, polyps on the bladder surface. I, we don't know why they occur. We don't see them with all kids at birth with bladder extrophy, but um, the recommendation is to excise those um, uh, at the time of closure. You need to, because sometimes these hamartomas or polyps can be so, uh, so large, so thick that you can't close the bladder into a into a normal configuration without excising them. Um, you don't have to worry much about the bladder mucosa because it will re-mucosalize uh, rather quickly um, after you close the bladder. Um, 
questions about neurologic function, these kids do actually have normal, I'll, I'll put that in quotations, normal neurologic function because the, the dissection is fairly extensive around the bladder when we do these. And it would probably be very easy to defunctionalize the bladders. Um, uh, and I think many of these kids that are able to volitionally void do so with Valsalva. Um, and there is an increased ratio of collagen to smooth muscle in newborns, but once the bladder is closed, this appears to go back to a more normal ratio. These are hematomas or polyps, and they should be uh, removed. Um, here's a boy in Zambia that um, is another very, very typical find of a kid with bladder extrophy. The emphalocele is epithelialized over. In fact, <clears throat> a lot of his anterior bladder or posterior bladder wall has epithelialized. <clears throat> Luckily, under anesthesia, once we push back this, he actually had a fairly good sized bladder. He was, and he again was between one or two years of age. Um, so he had a fairly reasonable bladder plate to use for reconstruction. Um, there's a couple other just incidental things. Upper tracts are usually normal in these kids, as I've mentioned. The ureters are structurally normal. However, 100% of children after closure are going to have vesicoureter reflux. Um, at, delivery, at delivery, when we see these kids, we typically tie off their umbilical stump with silk uh, because the, the typical thing we do here in the States is they get a clamp put on it, like a plastic clamp that irritates the bladder, kind of flops around and we, we get rid of that. And then we cover with saran wrap. Um, it's very difficult to keep this on, but it, it gives a little bit of a barrier between the diaper uh, and the bladder. Um, if the bladder plate is too small, as in this boy, you reassess them four to five months later. Um, the bladder may be larger. I think typically I would take this child to the operating room to see if there isn't some bladder internally that can be used for reconstruction. But ultimately, if this bladder is so small for closure, then, then it may require um, maybe consideration for an early bladder augmentation. I have only done one of those, so it's very rare to see it, I'd say. And when you look at places that do numbers of bladder extrophy, um, that uh, like Johns Hopkins, uh, Boston Children's here, they um, do very few. I, I can't think of uh, really any series that I've seen that discusses this. So the, girls, the goals of um, surgical management is a secure function, cosmetically acceptable genitalia, urinary continence, volitional voiding eventually, low pressure storage, quite important to preserve renal function. And now we get to uh, the better part of this talk, which I, I, I actually enjoy, uh, is just talking about the differences in closure. Now, um, I'm just gonna talk about the two most common types. Uh, when I went through residency, Dr. Jeffs and Gerhardt, um, and Dr. Gerhardt is uh, going into retirement apparently, and Dr. Jeffs passed away a number of years ago, um, really developed this system of, of a three-stage repair Whereas a newborn, you close only the bladder, you may need to do an osteotomy. The second operation is at a year of age where you repair the epispadius. And then at four to five years after the bladder's had chance to grow because of some outlet resistance, you can do a bladder neck reconstruction, which is the young D's led better bladder neck reconstruction. Uh, Grady, Rich Grady and Mike Mitchell, um, around 1993, I'll say um, began, uh, maybe even a little before that, began closure of all those three operations in one. Um, and that's the method that I adopted fairly early. This is the um, Hopkins method or the MSRBE, which I think stands for Modern Staged uh, Reconstruction of Bladder Extrophy. Um, and uh, 
you can see what's simply done here, whether it's male or female, is outlining the bladder, rolling the urethra into the tube, into a tube. Let me go back one. Um, and then closing the symphysis pubis, they make it look pretty easy here. Here's the symphysis pubis is closed. And you leave these kids uh, without doing any, really any work on the penile urethra and you leave these kids with an epispadius. Um, and there's a couple problems in my mind that I have with this is really, you can't get the urethra below the intrasymphyseal band or into the intrasymphyseal band, which is ultimately the, I think the pelvic floor. And that's very important. Um, a lot of times with these kinds of closure, if you did a cystoscopy when they're older, you'll see that their urethra is very close to the surface of not only the penis, but also at the symphysis when it separates and they sometimes get a fistula right about here and even into the bladder. So it's very superficial, it's non-functional, and then it's difficult to dissect this area away later, again, thinking backward, later when you've got to do a bladder neck reconstruction. So I had problems under understanding how this would work any better. With the Mitchell technique, you do make a deep incision into the intersymphyseal band. And I'll try to show you a picture of that. So you really don't do a bladder neck reconstruction. Um, these were the original pictures from the Journal of Urology article. And you can see they basically outline the urethra with the bladder. They keep everything intact. And um, they mobilize the urethra, including the prostate, away from the corporal bodies. Here are the corporal bodies. Here's the urethral flap. And they take that and they roll it into a tube. So the difference in these two pictures, here they separate the corporal bodies. And they also separate all the penile skin. So everything is taken apart. The urethra is then closed tubularized, tubularizing the bladder neck, tubularizing the bladder, closing the bladder. And then the important part doesn't really show up well here, but you do need to drop the urethra in between the corporal bodies, which you rotate uh, medially inward, suture them together. At the same time, you incise into the pelvic floor. Uh, this is, I'm not sure where it was. I think I was in Zambia with, and this is Rich Grady, who is who was on that paper, unfortunately, who passed away as a young guy, passed away a few years ago. Um, and here's us doing a, a bladder extrophy closure. Um, this is uh, some pictures that I took of a boy who I had taken to the operating room and could see that he had a fairly reasonable bladder plate underneath her, you can't tell. But he was about, he was a prenatal diagnosis, 22 hours at the time of reconstruction. And whether you can see this well or not, his bladder is closed here. These tubes both go into the ureters, come out through the embolicus. These are his corporal bodies. This is his urethra in the midline. I, and I, in this case, I got a fairly long urethral closure. And then I, um, this is just a sideways view of the same, the sa of the same operation. The, the symphysis is still wide open and then closed, uh, reconstructing the penis, um, leaving a malachite in. The ureteral catheters I typically leave in for about 10 to 12 days, a malachite and the stent stays in the urethra. It's really just there as a stent for I would leave that probably in a little bit longer than 10 days at this point. But I do leave them in a spica cast. I don't, I don't use external fixation. I don't like it in these kids. I don't think it works as effectively. And then through the umbilicus, you can see that I have the um, super pubic tube and feeding tubes. Um, and this was the post-operative outcome, probably, a, I don't know, probably a couple months later. Now, this boy went on to uh, he could not stay dry at nighttime. He was wet. He did have some continence, but the important thing is to wait on these kids. Um, and some people would say you wait until their prostate gets bigger, which is not until adolescence. And when that occurs, you can start to see continence for a number of reasons. So 
waiting is not easy for a lot of people. And it really is then um, a decision uh, based on your expertise. And if you think that child is ever gonna become continent again, and if you, and I, and I think one thing that's reasonable to do is surveillance cystoscopy and filling the bladder with fluid under anesthesia at about 20 centimeters of water to see what kind of volume you're getting. And if you're noticing the volumes going up and these kids are sort of borderline dry, then I, you give these kids time. Um, but if you find that their bladder remains small through years of development, then you're, you may be forced to do a bladder neck reconstruction. Um, this is another boy, um, again, black classic bladder extrophy. Um, and I think I'm showing this because this kid had a much bigger bladder that I'm in the process of closing here. And this was the urethra. This urethra wasn't quite as remarkable. Uh, corporal bodies, as you can see, are quite small. You leave the glands obviously attached to the corporal bodies because the blood supply is coming from the neurovascular bundle, which is more lateral. And again, this is a kid I did probably before 48 hours of age um, with the complete closure. The other thing that should be mentioned with these kids is that you're gonna follow them for their whole life. There's not a time, oh, so I showed this picture because in this case, I brought his urethra out in a hypospadiac area. But that's a lot easier to reconstruct down the road at perhaps a year from now than an epispadiac urethra in my, feel, my feeling. So this kid did fine. Um, and I followed him. I still follow all these kids into their 20s. Um, this boy now is a teenager. Um, I started this a long time ago. Um, it's been written about, but I like uh, spica casts. I didn't have much luck trying to keep kids immobilized with uh, Bucks traction or Brant or modified Brant traction. I just found that every day we were having to reapply mermaid wraps and all the other things that um, Hopkins had sort of taught us to do. And so I went to this, you know, the idea is just really immobilizing the hips. And even more recently, there's been a paper out of England of where they don't even immobilize the hips. They just get a good closure and they don't, they think that, and that may be true that you really, we go through painstaking um, care. Um, and the reason why I like the spike is too, is that you don't get the breakdown of the skin at the ankles that you would typically see in kids in traction. Um, they actually do very well in this and parents can manage them pretty easily as far as changing diapers. Um, so osteotomy, when do I do it? Well, in the old days, if it was greater than four centimeters, but, but now since I wait until these kids are older, they all get osteotomies. And it's a Salter type osteotomy. That's the most common type of osteotomy that uh, orthopedic surgeons know. Um, and so when you talk to them about, you know, can you do an osteotomy? They have different ideas of what that means. But if you talk about a Salter osteotomy, where you're, um, where, and this is typically, it's uh, an incision into the transverse innominate, and right here, and then an incision into the uh, vertical iliac. So there's two incisions. I'm pointing with my finger as though you can see what I'm talking about. So here's the, here's the, um, the incision to the vertical iliac right here. And then here's one across the anominate, um, the transverse anominate. And this causes a rotation. And then you can either put these kids in spica or do an X fix with them. Um, this is a little video of a kid who actually has cloacal extrophy. Um, but I will show you this is one incision. This incision is actually into the anterior iliac. Uh, crest basically. So you can see that there's a pivot point both here across the anominate and the anterior iliac. And, and that's kind of what it takes to get these kids 
uh, so they close without tension. And then a modified spike, and there's different variations you can use. Just leg spike I like now. I don't usually put them in this full body thing. I kind of just put the legs in a bar across and it works very nicely. You can see though, after where their symphysis always separates. So don't be surprised. Um, this is what I was talking about when it came to dropping the urethra into the, into the pelvic diaphragm, especially in girls. Their vagina is anterior. Um, their urethra is sitting up top here on top. You really wanna drop that all down below. So here's the urethra now closed. Uh, the pelvic floor is dropped. You have to make incisions on both sides. It drops the vagina back to a bit normal position and then you close the symphysis. Um, and then this is um, just, again, these are from um, Campbell's. Um, I, I think they still use the same exact, uh, exact pictures of getting this pelvic floor to drop down um, and closing the urethra. So it, it's the same principles as the male. Whoops. Um, this is a girl in Senegal, um, very common, again, a little bit older, epithelialized and phallocele, epithelialization of the bladder plate. Um, she has a bifid clitoris. This is her vagina right there. And her anus is anterior, anteriorly displaced right about here. So um, this was her after closure. So there has to be some mobilization. Typically you bring the incisions on the inside of the clitoris here and around the vagina, and then you drop this whole complex down in between. So the urethra gets closed up to about this point, just as it normally would be in position over the vaginal opening. But it's very common to see these kids also kind of come in at this age and you can't see the vagina. The vagina is here. You, it may be a very fine membrane closed covering it. So it gets confusing sometimes. And then this is um, uh, actually some different kids that had uh, epispadias. And again, I, 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 I like to use the Mitchell technique of complete separation of the corporal bodies and urethra. And you can kind of see here in this picture upper right, Again, the urethra is brought between the corporal bodies. It's closed. It's a long urethra in this, in this kid's case. And then it's brought out right to the tip of the glands. And then skin closure, you kind of have to be creative sometimes. Here's a, a boy that I saw with epispadius, same idea. Again, you, you have to very carefully dissect the urethra and prostate off the corporal bodies. Then you can separate the corporal bodies, transpose the urethra, and then close everything up. Here's the urethra transposed. Corporal bodies are above now, and you close. You can, and here we can get the urethra out to the glands um, and preserve the penile skin. Uh, what are the other options? Well, people have used radical cystectomy and urinary diversion. Ureterostomy was very popular for a while in these kids. Uh, the concern was, of course, was hyperkalemic acidosis, rectal prolapse, polynephritis. And, and so one thing that you have to consider sometimes in older patients before you offer them something like ureter, a type of ureter sigmoidostomy is do they have rectal continence? Um, the malignancy, though, is 700 times age match population. The argument has been that it's maybe reasonable to consider using these operations in kids, older kids, teenagers, because you really don't have an option for a reconstructive option, especially if catheters are difficult to come by. If you wanted to create a neobladder out of intestine, have them catheterize. Um, and you cannot get a functional bladder extrophy closure in these kids. I think it would be nearly impossible. So you're really left doing either a diversion of some sort. And if you don't have an option to use uh, catheters um, or they're unwilling to use catheters, then um, you can do something called a mines two pouch. Um, so in the early 20th century, um, the most, most uh, were incontinent with extrophy with primary closures, you would imagine probably closer to 
if you did a cystectomy, uh, you could do ureter sigmoid ostomies, and these people would live to a point of then having problems with malignancy and polynephritis. Again, the, 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 the argument has been, well, maybe these people won't live quite as long, so you don't have to worry about the, the uh, colonic cancers that you might see otherwise at the anastomosis of the ureters where they, where they connect. And that's because I think these patients also have a problem getting to um, see a gastroenterologist for an annual um, uh, 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 colonoscopy. So this was a technique uh, called a uh, Young's uh, young D's closure of a ureter into a tinea of a piece of intestine. These are some of the original, well, these are coffee's drawings, I believe. Um, but this would at least give the opportunity for an anti-refluxing ureter um, into a portion of uh, colon. The problem is these, these, this colon can still contract. And so it transmit pressures directly to the kidney. And those pressures might include, back, obviously, bacteria from the, from the uh, stool. Um, but what do you do with these two kids? Um, this is the child on the left is a 17 or 18 year old girl with extrophy, very similar to what we saw earlier in, this, in the little girl that I showed you. Um, her vagina is right in between her um, clitoral, uh, clitori the bifid clitoris. She has an epithelialized omphalocele. We remove the omphalocele anyway, but even you can see uh, epithelialization of the bladder wall here. This is a boy, unfortunately, from Zambia who I'd seen the year prior and his urine was so, uh, it was so detrimental to his genitalia that all these uh, lesions appeared. He was status post uh, one or two closures attempts done in Zambia before I met him. And this is what he was, what he was left with. This is his penis right here. This is uh, all there was. The rest is just very, very fibrotic skin. Um, we sent them uh, something akin to Aquaphor, which is a type of uh, lotion to maybe as a barrier to get him ready for the next year. Uh, but still he was left with keloids and, and this uh, very abnormal skin. Um, for the girl from Ghana, for that teenage girl, what we did here is something I probably would never do again, but we created a neobladder out of small bowel. Um, I used the, her bladder plate to close the abdominal wall defect. And I think that's actually been a very nice thing to do. It's, and I didn't come up with this, Bob Wynn came up with this. And uh, I traveled with him on one of these trips early on to Ghana and there's a big abdominal wall defect you have to contend with. And we didn't do osteotomies in her because we simply created a, a, um, a, a neobladder and used her appendix uh, as a catheterizable stoma. Um, and then we closed her. She had tubes obviously in her ureters and just to make sure she was fully diverted until he, she was healed. Um, and um, the problem with, with kids like this is that we don't know what happens to them. They have a catheterizable sto stoma that we created at the embolicus. It's a pretty involved operation. Um, and um, we don't know long-term how she, how she did. We also did a feminizing genitoplasty. So there's quite a few portions of this of one operation. This is the boy with the failed bladder extrophy closure that I mentioned previously. Um, and uh, we did, what I would recommend now as a better procedure is a MINDS two pouch. So the, the idea behind a MINDS pouch is ureter sigmoidostomies, but detubularizing the sigmoid uh, where you reimplant the ureters. And you do that so they don't get the mass contraction of the bowel so it transmits uh, any, any bacteria, um, it helps control reflux, et cetera. So um, you take the ureters from the retroperitoneum, um, you isolate the area of just above the rectum, um, sort of the downturn of the S of where you're going to use. Um, you have to be sure to bring the ureters underneath the mesentery from the left side. 
that can cause obstruction. You open up the sigmoid in an S-curve type fashion, probably around 20 centimeters, and then you close it. Um, you close it, um, if you're opening it, we'll consider this horizontal, you close it vertically. Then you create this area here for your place of where your ureters are gonna be reimplanted as such. And this is not actually a very difficult operation. Once the ureters are implanted, you can put a rectal tube in, pass the ureteral catheters through it. I leave these ureteral catheters in for about 10 days. Um, and this is the outcome of that boy. I, I use feeding tubes, uh, like eight French feeding tubes up the ureters. Then this is the rectum. And then, um, this was the outcome. We got rid of most of his keloid and had this kind of star closure and this was the penis at the end. And, and this is simply a drain. Um, and then we closed his urethra back to his seminal vesicles. So this is kind of how he was closed. Um, and again, he did well at the time of, the time that he was uh, in the hospital with us. And um, I kept in touch with the surgeon for, I still keep in touch with him. It's been now, it's gotta be at least six or seven years. And he only saw the boy back once um, and he was doing well about a year after surgery. You do have to put them on some bicarb, uh, which is pretty cheap um, because of the uh, metabolic acidosis. So this results in a low pressure reservoir, improved continence rate. These kids are continent. They don't have the wraparound smell. Um, you prevent reflux and polynephritis, um, and it's, I think, a relatively simple procedure. Um, and maybe what I'll do, since it's after three at this point, I'm going to stop here because um, this sort of gets into some other, some other things, and maybe we could just stop right there. Does, any, does anybody have any questions? I guess, Galena, you're the last person standing. <laughs> yes, I'm the only one here. <laughs> so oh, no. um, the, 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 the first question I'm going to ask is, uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that um, you, you, you used to close uh, during the newborn time period, and now you've chosen to, to wait uh, a little bit. I would like to know why. Well, it's, I, I think the reason we did it before was because there's apparently a hormone that mothers have that cause called relaxin, which causes the, which causes the tendons and the soft tissue of the pelvis to relax in the, in the babies. So you could actually close the, the pelvis without needing to do osteotomies with less tension. And therefore the idea was if there's less tension, there's less risk that it will, the bladder will prolapse later. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other reason was that these kids are physiologically completely different if you look at them at 48 hours versus if you look at them at two months of age or three months of age. And they're a lot healthier to undergo a long surgical procedure. Um, it's actually managing these kids from a fluid standpoint, we really try to limit fluids in them, is very difficult in the newborn period. Whereas when they're two to three months limiting fluids for this kind of surgery, so you can get a better closure with less edema is actually more, more possible, mm -hmm. more possible. Part of it is also the pain management too of these kids. I think um, you're really limited in the newborns to some extent, whereas kids get older. So there's a number of reasons. We end up, I think we have a better functional closure anyway with osteotomies. So you may say, well, you're trading off osteotomies and a later closure for those mm -hmm. reasons, whereas you don't need osteotomies. I don't think there's any downside to osteotomies. Um, if anything, I think it gives, in boys in particular, a better cosmetic, or I'll say a better functional closure, trying to bring the corporal mm -hmm. bodies together. And, and what, what suture material do you use then uh, for, for the bladder closure, for the, for the urethroplasty, for what, what yeah. suture material do you use? It's really your choice, as long as it's absorbable. I like, I like braided 
uh, mm -hmm. sutures, so Vicryl or Polyzorb, um, are the two braided. And, and I, I tend to use anything from a 3.0 for a bladder closure to the urethra. I, I use a 6.0. Um, I typically use 6.0, maybe 5.0 for that, the bladder neck. Uh, mm -hmm. The only time I use permanent suture is uh, for, yeah, for the closure of the pubic ramus. And um, I've, I've used um, proline or Surger Pro. That depends on what suits, you know, suture company you get it from. And I use a big stitch. So it might be in a newborn, like a 2.0 or even an O. Um, I've kind of recently, more recently, have been using an absorbable, like an OPDS or Maxon. Um, in part because I think it's a temporary closure anyway, and that suture doesn't need to be there forever. Mm -hmm. So eventually, after the cast comes off, the symphysis is going to separate regardless if you have a, a permanent suture in there or not. Okay. All right. Um, what I can say is that in general, these, these cases are really difficult to, to, to manage. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you, we, one needs to, 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 to be exposed uh, to these kind of cases, like uh, have, have been exposed for a long time to be able to, to, to repair them and see there are rare cases and also the, 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 the material that is to be used uh, sometimes not available, especially for the catheters and, uh, and the suture, suture material sometimes. So uh, all this really makes uh, the management of these cases uh, difficult here. Oh, I, yeah, I, I totally, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's heartbreaking mm -hmm. to see these kids and you really yeah. can't help them. Um, and you know they're out there and it's just happened, you know, it's hit or miss if they're going to show up to the clinic. And I, you know, we could probably do three hypospadias repairs in the time that we do an extra fee closure, or maybe four. Um, mm -hmm. And you'd say, well, what's the better thing to do? Um, it's, it really is, you know, as, as, a uro as a pediatric urologist, you really feel like you want to do the most, I feel like I want to do the most complicated things. It may be better though to close, you know, to, to, to start again, even with any surgical training when it comes to pediatrics is to start with things like hypospadias repair, orchidopexy, um, things like that. Reimplantation re aren't so, I think, as much needed in Africa as it is here. Um, but all these, all these kinds of procedures are, you know, the same building blocks that we use for extra fee closure. So any sort of pediatric stuff you do, you're, you're adopting it. It can be adopted for sure. extra fee closure. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Is that a baby, uh, that a baby over there? This is, yeah, sorry. Who's that? Who's that? Uh, this is my youngest. This is Theo. Yeah. Oh, hello. Hello, <laughs> Tio. <laughs> How old is How old is he? He yes. has four months. Wow. Oh, I see. <laughs> A handsome boy. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Dr. Schneck, for doing this, this talk. And thank you, Galena, for joining us. Thank you very much. You, you will show with me the, 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 the video so yes. that I can share to my colleagues as well.